I am very, very proud to have been able to be part of the history of music. I'm unwilling to go around shouting, look at me, I'm a part of the history of music. But I do understand that Bob and I are an important part of music history because that idea has been used in every direction that music can go into. I'm Herb Deutsch, and I am very happy to be here. I think that I'm best known for the invention and development of the Moog synthesizer. My musical life began, I don't remember very much of it, but this is what I do remember. I was three years old and I was out in the garage and I was standing there with a stick in my hand and with that stick I was hitting the ground. And as I moved the stick, I knew that it was changing pitches. And so I figured, oh, if I keep moving the stick around, if it goes bum, 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 I heard that, and so I could play things with it. And then all of a sudden, the other part of my three-year-old brain came in, and it said, what are you doing? That stick is not making anything more than noise when it hits the ground. And that scared the hell out of me. And I ran into the house to my mother. It's a fascinating story because what it does is help me to understand my own musicality. I think perhaps the first thing that I really heard that moved me was Edgar Varese's work. I was so excited by how he had changed his idea of what music was, that it was sound organized in time. Very simple terms, but sound organized in time is a perfect definition of what music is and can be. All of the big events in the history of music had to do with changing and developing new sound, new instruments. The guy who invented the piano, nobody knows his name, but the piano was the most important instrument of the 18th century. When the piano forte was invented, that's the name it was given at the time, meaning soft and loud. You couldn't do that on a harpsichord, which was the major instrument of Europe at that time. All of a sudden, the musical world was turned around because you had instruments that could be built large enough to be really heard or played very, very softly. And orchestras changed. The orchestras became bigger because of the piano. The halls that music played in became bigger. The whole idea of what music can be became much larger, and it was literally within 30 or 40 years that music changed into a period where historic musical development and technical development coincide. The late 1950s is when my head really became filled with the possibilities of where are these other things going on? I loved to play jazz, so I was always playing jazz. And in the 1950s, jazz was going through a wonderful world of change. Composers started to explore how new sounds can change their music. I was very excited when I first heard 
music produced electronically. And I had to understand what that meant. Of course, we're talking about the frequency of sound vibrations being pitches, the relationship of all these things becoming harmonies and how they can change the whole world. In 1963, there was a terrible event that happened in America, and that was the attack and murder of four young girls. A group of Ku Klux Klan's men broke into a little church in Birmingham, Alabama, and killed little girls who were rehearsing for a Christmas play. The event hit America. In a Baptist church in Birmingham, Alabama, the Sunday school lesson is from Matthew. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Then a bomb blows up under the church steps. They die James Baldwin writes a bitter epitaph. Six kids were murdered in Birmingham on a Sunday and in Sunday school in a Christian nation, and nobody cares. I was picked up by that horror, and I wanted to express something about that. And the first thing I thought, I needed to use these new sounds. Most of what I used in that piece was recorded sound, recorded voices from the radio, people talking about the horror of that time and people making comments about it. The impact of the blast was obvious. I wanted to remind people also of the fact that Christmas was coming. And I used a recording of a wonderful Christmas chant from the Middle Ages. There were a lot of things that were mixed into that piece because my mind was completely mixed and I was looking to build a new kind of music. A message from our sponsor. The most important melody I used in that piece was Frere Jacques, which occurs in this piece basically throughout. However, police in Birmingham feel that. The reason I did that is because I was writing it to Jacques, John Kennedy. It was my idea of writing to the president and saying, listen to this, you're the president, listen to what's going on. The piece was completed two or three days before he was assassinated. That piece was also, I believe, the very first piece of real electronic music that Bob Moog heard. When I think of this, even talking about my own music, it is sound, organized, put together in a way that I want people to hear it and understand my feelings and do it through a period of time so that after this piece is over, you have heard it for those six minutes that it lasts. You know what I wanted to say.
When I wrote that piece in 1963, I was looking, certainly, for where a new sound could be and what I could do to discover that new sound. One of my students showed me an article that was just written by a guy named Bob Moog on building a theremin. And I thought maybe I could do this myself, but I knew I would need the parts, so I called Bob Moog. I did reach his wife, Shirley, at that time, and I did do what probably everyone else did, say, is this the place where I can reach Mr. Moog? <laughs> And she immediately created, <laughs> no, that is not the way the word is pronounced. And I never forgot it from that point. I did put together a theremin. And that put in my hands the feel of how electronic instruments could become part of my world. I was a new college teacher. I, I wanted to take advantage of one of the nice things about it, and that would be to go to something in New York State called All State, where you can hear all the kids play all different orchestras and bands. I went up to Rochester, New York. The second day of All State, I was downstairs where various manufacturers were displaying things that were of, should have been of interest to um, music teachers throughout the state. And there was a room there, and I walked into that room, and in that room was a tall man and nothing else except a bunch of theremins. He introduced himself, and he said, my name is Bob Moog. And I said, oh, that's wonderful, because I just built one of your theremins. The first conversation that I had with Bob, I told him where I was musically, what I was wanting to do. I told Bob, you know, I'm doing this concert in New York. I'd love you to hear what I'm doing. He said, I'm going to go to that concert and then we can, we'll see what happens after that. The concert was done in the studio of a sculptor whose name was Jason Seeley, on East 13th Street, down in Greenwich Village. The idea of the program was to play music and improvise on Jason's sculpture. And his sculpture was made all of automobile bumpers. Bob loved the concert. We did talk right away about the possibility of building this new musical instrument that we had only discussed two months earlier. The kind of musical instrument was really not certain until that summer. And it was June of 1964. When we went in the basement of his shop, he had already set up a keyboard, which is a device that I knew perfectly well, an oscillator that would produce a sound when I played a note. That was the only thing that I understood and was made to understand right away. The rest was the magic of discovery. The one thing that the instrument lacked was the, the concept of musical articulation. I said, Bob, I play the trumpet. And when you blow a trumpet, it goes, ta. It's got like an attack. And when you play a piano and you hold the key down, the tone decays. And I said, those are things that musicians need to have to make true music, and Bob knew immediately how he could do it. He said, Herb, do me a favor. Go across the street to the hardware store, and uh, I need uh, to have a doorbell button. <laughs> and that's what he said to me. And 
I, you know, knowing Bob for a day or so, I understood that. (laughs) And I went over and I got a doorbell button. And I remember that I paid 35 cents for it. I came back to the place and I said, here it is. And he already had stuff that he had written out on paper. By that afternoon, had it set up that if I were playing a note with my left hand and pressed a button with my right hand, the note would get a trigger and the trigger would start what eventually became called the envelope generator. It may not have been what we thought it would be, but in many ways it it was what we thought it would be, without knowing physically, visibly, what that was going to be. It became personally the thing that we thought it would be. And it is the thing that I think the whole music world understands as being both an approach to music and a complete solution at the same time. I think the first true classical performance of the Moog synthesizer was in 1965 at Town Hall. Now, Town Hall, at that time, was probably as big a hall for concerts in many ways as Carnegie Hall. I had been playing and developing a group which I called the New York Improvisation Quartet. On that concert at Town Hall, we had a Moog modular instrument. While the instrument was working and playing beautifully, we were unable to get the accurate nine volt power supply that I believe was needed. And so we took two car batteries and put them on the floor of the stage and hooked it up to the Moog synthesizer. We were playing very new music. I mean, we we were playing a very out, way out music at that concert. The next really important performance by the Moog synthesizer was really a quartet of four Moogs that was built to be part of the Museum of Modern Art's Summer Arts Festival, which they called Music in the Garden. We had very little time to prepare a concert and It was one of those amazing last-minute events because the day before the concert, most of the instruments were still being assembled in New York City. The final instrument in that quartet had really cool new sounds. It was really a lead-type instrument. It was designed to be an instrument that would allow you to play solos, change colors very quickly, and that was the very same instrument that went to Keith Emerson. We had a very brief time to rehearse before the crowd began to come in. But being the Museum of Modern Art, it was an amazingly filled crowd. (music) 
99% of people in New York City had no idea what a Moog, or a they still were saying Moog, was all about. Here we are with one day of rehearsal with instruments that most of us really had never had their hands on beyond that one day. It was in memory beautiful, at the time frightening, but it was one of those incredible times. The concept of expressivity in the tools that they use is primary to human beings. And while it always has been, the tools have not been sophisticated enough to relate to the kind of changes that our minds can go through. Subtle feelings of warmth, sudden feelings of fear, sudden feelings of excitement, Music is the art that can do that. From the very beginnings of Moog music, from the time that Bob and I worked together, Bob and I understood one thing very clearly, and that is the designer of the instrument must understand the needs of the artist must understand the minds and the creativity and the thoughts of the artist. And the artist should then recognize the designer's ability to produce what that artist needs. The instrument has changed the way people think about what music should be. I am, I think, a little bit secretly very proud of having been a part of music's change. With Bob especially, the two of us have been able to put a whole new change in where all of music can be. We no longer think about Western music or Eastern music. You know, music is music. Thank you.